So again, Paul in this uh, treatise on really the issues of salvation, first principle we began uh, there in uh, chapter uh, 1, verse 17, uh, that basically all are condemned. In his summary statement in verse 23 of chapter 3, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, dealt with the religious person, the non-religious person, and explained why not only are all condemned, but all are without excuse. There'll be no one that will stand before God one day and be able to say, well, my situation was different. Uh, no, uh, it will be the same for everyone. Then he turns that corner, as we did in our last study, to begin to talk about justification by faith. <clears throat> we kind of gave you this, uh, this definition. Justification is the act of God whereby he declares the believing sinner righteous in Christ on the basis of the finished work of Christ on the cross. Sometimes we say justification means it's just as if you hadn't sinned. Sometimes we stop there, but that would be inappropriate in God's sight. <clears throat> you and I can be declared righteous but there's still issues to deal with in our lives because of sins that we've committed. I mean, I can get angry and punch somebody in the face and uh, in a moment pray and ask the Lord to uh, forgive me and be justified and he will justify me and I will be righteous in his sight. Doesn't mean the other guy's not gonna punch me back. You know, there's, there's, it's not as if we haven't committed any sin. There are still consequences, but in God's sight, and uh, we'll get more into it in a moment, but uh, as Paul explained justification by faith last week, now he's going to begin to give us a, a couple uh, of examples. And he's anticipating, again, his Jewish audience wanting to know what would Father Abraham say about all of this, this idea of justification by faith. So he's going to use him as his uh, prime example. He's already stated in, uh, uh, that Abraham is is the father of all them that believe, all that trusted Christ, uh, and certainly we all need to hear about him. There's a, it, it's a simple concept, it's a, it's a simple idea. I think to most people it's repulsive. This idea that God would forgive us and declare us to be righteous simply by faith. In our, in our flesh, we want, uh, we want it the old fashioned way. We want to earn it. You know, we, we want to have something to do with it. You know, we want to well, yeah, well, I believe that I'm saved by grace, but don't I also have to do these six other things, these 10 other things, keep the 12 rules, whatever it uh, might be. And Paul says, no, that's, uh, that's not necessary. In, quite, in fact, it's uh, the two things, rule keeping or the law and grace are mutually exclusive uh, of each other. Uh, this is a doctrine that's the foundation to who we are as Christians, and most Christians don't believe it. Or even if they have a mental assent, and I can explain it, and they go, yes, that's in the Bible, I believe it. But they don't really believe it. They don't believe it the next time they sin, the next time the enemy comes around and condemns them and drags them down in their faith and their relationship because of their own personal failures. Either their sin or somebody else's sin against them, uh, they struggle with it. Uh, <laughs> the most popular favorite song among Christians is Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. The saved a wretch like me. Most people have two problems with that. They don't think they're a wretch, which Paul's already laid that out, and he's going to emphasize it again here. Uh, and they, they, don't, they don't like that. <laughs> There's even some churches, uh, they, uh, they change the last line. Amazing grace, how sweet the, uh, the sound that saved someone like me. <laughs> they don't want to hear that, that we're a wretch in terms of God's sight and his perfect holiness in, uh, in who we are. And the idea of grace, they actually want to change the definition of grace. Paul's going to spend a great deal of time here early on uh, with the explanation we saw last week, uh, now with this idea of Abraham being our example. Uh, and again, we've emphasized the, the Jewishness of the letter. Romans comes pretty close to being what we might call a messianic epistle because primarily most of the way through he's dealing with his Jewish audience that are believers in Jesus that are there in the church at Rome. Obviously, the church has got some Gentiles in it. He does deal with them, but primarily he's trying to lay out this example of, uh, to them of Abraham because their view of Abraham was so exalted because he is the father of their faith. Of course, we're going to find out he's the father of our faith as well because of the justification. Uh, but there was, a, there was a lot of writings in the 
uh, in a lot of other documentations uh, written by the Jewish people that so exalt uh, Abraham. Uh, one of them even says that uh, in a thing called the Prayer of Manasseh that uh, it says, Thou therefore, O Lord, thou art the God of the righteous, has not appointed repentance unto the righteous, unto Abraham. In other words, Abraham was so righteous, he never had anything he needed to repent from. I'm not quite sure if they're reading the same book of Genesis that we're reading, you know, because when we studied his life, this guy had some major issues that he had to deal with. <clears throat> not only not trusting God at times, lying about his wife, on and on and on. But God never gave up on him. God kept working in, uh, in his life. Uh, but he does become the primary example here uh, of what it is to be justified by faith. So let's look at the first point that's in the first five verses. Uh, that Abraham is the prime example of justification by faith. What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, is found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, uh, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him... Uh, who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. So prime example of justification excludes work. Abraham was not justified by his works. Therefore, he has nothing to boast in. And, um, and, and before we can even get a little further into us, I want us to jump over to uh, James chapter 2 for a moment and deal with what we might call uh, a problem or an apparent contradiction. In James chapter, 20, uh, chapter 2, verse 21, James is writing. Now, we just said that Abraham was justified by his faith. What does James say? Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works? Oh, wait a minute. Are these guys saying the opposite? Well, on face value, they are saying the opposite. Uh, but they're saying the opposite for different reasons. And both of these guys are on the same side, uh, and it's important to see it. Notice, when was he justified by his works? when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar. Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect or uh, complete or mature. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God, and it was accredited to him as right for righteousness. That's our same verse Paul just quoted. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Do we have a problem here? No, actually, we don't. These guys are both on the same side. And I kind of like word pictures to help us understand a little bit. It's as if, as if the Apostle Paul is standing shoulder to shoulder, back to back, helping defend the faith with, with James, but against two different issues. Paul's trying to explain to us justification by faith in terms of how we're saved, how we come to faith in Jesus Christ. And then James is over here saying, says, yeah, but we're justified by works. And Paul could be saying, are you arguing with me? No, I'm agreeing with you. Who's your audience? He says, people that aren't saved. I'm trying to explain salvation. And he would say, that's not my audience. My audience is believers. People that are already walking with the Lord. They've already been justified by faith. But, but justification and God coming into your life means you should, it should show somewhere. It's uh, like the Rich Mullins song that, uh, that says that uh, uh, faith without works is like a submarine with screen doors. Uh, faith should accompany works. To, again, the Calvin saying that, uh, that we've uh, mentioned several times, Paul would say, faith alone saves. And James would say, but saving faith is never alone. Both of these things go together. One's talking to the unbeliever or the new believer to try to explain salvation. The other one is talking to people that are saved, but he doesn't want them to fall into the category of those that one day will come to Jesus and say, Lord, Lord. And he will say, away from me, for I never knew you. Because saving faith is never alone. It actually produces something in our lives. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, he imputes, we'll get into that term of what it means, he credits, he gives us a righteous standing before him, a relationship with him, and it should lead to something. It should lead to something else. It should lead to a changed life. And, uh, and again, so these two, James and Paul, are not contradictory. 
They're actually standing shoulder to shoulder, both defending the faith. One has an audience of people that are not saved or new Christians. The other one has an audience of people that have walked with the Lord. How do we know that? Because of what he says in the text. He says, was not Abraham justified by his works when? When he was first saved? No. When he took Isaac up to the mountain to offer him. Again, he is justified by faith in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. When does he take Isaac up on the mountain? Genesis 22, closer towards the end of his life. So here's a guy that was saved by faith. Paul says, and some, you know, possibly 30 years plus later, the example of that faith is he trusted God so much that he could take Isaac, his grown son, probably in his early 30s, up on Mount Moriah. And as the writer of Hebrews says, believing that if he needed to put a knife into him and sacrifice him, God would raise him from the dead because he was the promised child, the one that would carry the promises and the covenant on. Quite a demonstration of faith. Abraham doesn't start out that way. He starts out by believing a promise of God and being justified. By the end of his life, God has so worked, and there's a lot of ups and downs in Abraham's life, remember, uh, but he comes back, he walks strongly with the Lord at the end, so much that his saving faith has actually now been made mature and complete. How much? He's able to take Isaac to the top of the mountain. Does that make sense? These guys aren't contradicting each other. They're really talking about two different issues altogether. Let's go back to our text in, in Romans. Uh, a little more explanation, I think, is necessary in verse 1 and 2. Uh, there, Paul says in chapter 4, What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, was found according to the flesh? It doesn't mean his, uh, his physical descent in terms of the flesh. Uh, it just really is another word Paul uses for work or works. How do we know that? Because he repeats the same statement in verse 2. For if Abraham was justified by the flesh or by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Could Abraham be justified according to his flesh, to his works? Paul would say no. James would say he's justified according to his works in terms of the proof of the maturity of his faith that he's grown uh, over, over the years. Uh, those two incidents of his being justified, taking Isaac up on the mountain uh, decades apart. Uh, so again, we'd say that say, uh, faith alone saves, but faith, saving faith is never alone. Secondly, his prime example of justification is based on believing the promise. There, the promise in uh, Genesis 15, 6. And the, the context of that is, uh, is worth, certainly worth noting. Chapter 14, uh, again, it's been a long time since we were uh, that far back in Genesis. Chapter 14, you remember uh, there was a confederation of five kings uh, in the days of Abraham uh, that joined together uh, from the north and they kind of swept down into uh, to the south to the area of Sodom and Gomorrah down near by the Dead Sea uh, on a raiding party and they end up uh, taking over several cities, taking the people, uh, all of the loot and so forth and heading back home with it. <laughs> Abraham hears about it. You know, somebody tells him what's happened. He gets his 318 special ops guys they put their night vision goggles on, they hop onto their camels, and they head off at night. I'm not sure about the goggles, but he had 318 guys specifically trained to do this. Uh, and they, they head off, uh, and they catch them. And, they, and they, we've been there in Israel where they left from and where they caught them. And it's, it's quite a distance. It's about the, the length of, uh, uh, of the, uh, the state of uh, Israel. And there's, uh, there's actually a place in northern Israel where you can go today. Uh, that's a city gate that Abraham would have actually passed through on his way uh, to catch these guys. They catch them in the night. They're outnumbered. They're outgunned. But by surprise, they're able to overtake them and save everyone. No one, no one is, uh, is killed in terms of uh, Lot and his family and so forth. They get back again. He has a whole deal with uh, uh, Melchizedek and so forth, uh, the prince of Salem. He gets back home again. Uh, and in a sense, he starts thinking about the fact of uh, <clears throat> what's going to happen to me now. You know, yeah, we were successful in this. We had this little raiding party, and that went well. But uh, all of these guys might have big brothers <laughs> back home. We just took down five different kings when we did this. There's a whole lot of people we just made uh, very upset when we did this. Neighbor's out, uh, and he's kind of praying and kind of going through this whole thing and saying, what about the future, Lord? And, and by the way, 
You know, I, you've made these promises to me, but I've still never had a child. Where is the son uh, of the promise? Uh, and to kind of pick up the text in verse 2 of chapter 15, it says, But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And it, then Abram said, uh, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house uh, is my heir. One not born in my house is my heir. Uh, and of course, then we have the Lord's response in verse 4. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, uh, This one, the Eleazar, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now towards heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Pretty, I mean, he's kind of an older guy at this point. Uh, his wife has uh, not had kids for, uh, ever had children. Seems like she's barren. Uh, but his response is the uh, passage that James quotes. It's a passage that Paul quotes. Verse 6, Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. So he's 80 plus years old. Uh, Sarah's been un unable to conceive, but he believes God. God says, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to keep the promise. You're going to have a son. It's greater than that. Go outside, look at the stars. Uh, if you could count them, which you can, it means your descendants will be too numerous for you to count as well. And of course, then God then cuts covenant with him, takes him outside. Remember some of the ceremony, but the bottom line is there Animals are laid out that have been sacrificed. Both uh, parties would walk through promising to keep the covenant relationship, except God says, you just kind of lay down over here. I'm going to pass through because it's all on me. I'm going to keep the promise. It's unconditional uh, made to you. This is going to happen, uh, and God believes it. And then this word that is used here, credited, uh, is uh, in the Greek is uh, logazomai, uh, and it's a banking term. And we're going to see it used several ways, several times in this text. Counted, reckoned, considered, imputed, computed. Uh, again, a banking term explaining to him the issues of salvation. And here's what the equation looks like. God is saying that on one side of the ledger, the debit, we've all got debit cards, and every time we use it, money's coming out. Uh, and you've got to put that money back in. So our debit's on one side, what we owe. And what we owe is the price for our sins, all the sins we've ever committed in the past, in the present, all the sins we'll ever commit in the future. And it's not only ours, the debt that is owed for the sin of this world is that for every person that has ever lived. That's the debt. On the other side, who can make the payment? Only Jesus Christ. So his death and his shed blood, we saw last week, supported by 1 Timothy 2, uh, excuse me, 1 John 2, 2, is Jesus Christ died for the sins of the whole world. So he could pay the price in order to redeem us, that was our word propitiation, and pay the price so that all of our sin could be forgiven. Is everybody saved? Is everybody's sin forgiven? No, because each person has to come and ask for that forgiveness. And when we do that, all of your sin, past, present, and future, is all forgiven. And, uh, and we are credited in our account in heaven with righteousness. Now again, does that, does that mean that we're righteous? No, it doesn't. It means God declares us righteous in his eyes, in our standing in heaven, relationally with him, we are righteous. But we all still struggle with sin. And, uh, you know, and again, Paul's going to get into this idea of walking in the spirit, dealing with sin. Paul's going to talk about his own struggles in his own life. But we all still have problems in, the, in this area. And uh, it can kind of be illustrated in this uh, interesting dream I had a few years ago. And it's one of those uh, probably occurred on a Sunday night after preaching a sermon. And uh, <clears throat> those are usually more nightmares than they are dreams. But uh, uh, nonetheless, I... Uh, had the dreams, one of those where you're in heaven, an angel is showing me around, and as I enter heaven, there seems to be clocks all over the place, and they seem to be segregated, and I couldn't help but ask, you know, what the deals with a clock, and the angel explained that each one of these represents each person on earth, uh, and uh, they seem to be segregated, and he says, well, it's by churches, and I said, well, where's Calvary Chapel Windward, and he showed me the area, and I went over there, and there was names on the clocks, and the hands were kind of spinning, some faster than others. So I asked about that. He says, well, every time a person sins, 
the, the hand goes around. So I thought it would be interesting to kind of take a look at some of your names, see if I could find them. I found several of them. But there was one that was missing. I said, I gotta ask you, where's Charlie Cook? He says, Charlie Cook? He goes, we keep his in the office and use it as a fan. <laughs> And I could have said it about any one of you. I just have to, Charlie's the most gracious guy here. That's why I can use him for my jokes. Yeah. I try to make fun of anybody over 99 anytime I have the opportunity and uh, couldn't pass it up. It illustrates the point. God declares us righteous. It doesn't mean we're righteous, does it? And, uh, uh, and it's, this becomes an issue to his Jewish audience because they think Abraham is pretty righteous. I, I don't know if they're reading the same Bible we're reading. But they have a lot of uh, stuff that they've written about him that would indicate he has nothing to repent of. In fact, they believe that he kept the law perfectly. Yeah, the law didn't come for 400 years later. How did he do that exactly? I don't know, but he just did. And so Paul's trying to overcome all of this to help them understand what it is to be justified by faith. And that Abraham is the example of that based on his believing the promise of Genesis 15, 16. Thirdly, the principle works works versus grace is stated again there in verses four and five now to him who works you're going to earn something what do you earn wages uh they are not counted as grace <laughs> you don't work for grace you work for wages uh, but as debt in contrast to that if you don't want to try to work your way to heaven but to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies there's our word again the ungodly his faith is accounted for righteousness now, we read that and go, yeah, I think I got that. But to, again, the first century listeners uh, there in Rome, this is a very shocking statement uh, because of what he has said in saying that it's God that justifies the ungodly. Some translations would say the wicked, and they would have a little problem with that because uh, in, the, in the law, in Exodus 23, 7, it says, I will not justify the wicked. And Deuteronomy 25, uh, 1, it says, justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. Solomon, when he dedicates the temple uh, to God, condemns the wicked and justifies the righteous. And we could go on and on. So these Jewish audience saying God's going to justify the wicked and the ungodly go, <laughs> I don't think, I think you got something wrong here, Paul. And why would they think that? Because they thought they were pretty righteous themselves because they had grown up being circumcised, keeping the Shabbat, keeping the Sabbath, keeping the law, keeping the commandments and so forth. They thought they were doing pretty good and they didn't see themselves. The problem with that is there is none righteous, no, not even one. All are wicked and come short of the glory of God would be another way of looking at Romans 3.23. I know that's not a complimentary term uh, and I hope it doesn't hurt your self-esteem. <laughs> to know that the Bible calls you wicked and ungodly. But that's the point. That's who God justifies. And how does he do it? By faith and by faith alone. And uh, that would have been a harsh thing for them to hear and to understand. Paul's taking this time going through this. He explains it and he gives a great example. You don't get much better than Abraham in order to explain justification by faith. But if he had to give one more example, a pretty good one would be David. And that's what he does next. David's confession in the Psalms is uh, he's going to quote Psalm 32, confirms justification by faith, verse 68. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes, that's our word again, righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not, there's our word again, shall not impute sin. Sin. So Paul turns to the psalm for two reasons. One is because of the rabbinical uh, principle of interpretation. He takes uh, this word, again, we said in the Greek, uh, logagosmai, uh, and he takes that and says, what's the Hebrew equivalent to it? And he finds it in both of these passages. It's in Genesis 15, 6. David uses it here in Psalm 32. It's the Hebrew word hasab. So when that word gets translated into the Greek, it's the same one Paul uses. He's using these words together saying, you'll note, my Jewish audience, that when I talk about this idea of credit, impute, uh, and so forth, give credit to, it's the same word used of 
Abraham, it's the same word that David uses of himself. So he uses it because of the principle of interpretation. Maybe more importantly to us, he uses it because David certainly had uh, what we might say unmerited righteous credit given to him. Of course, the context is David and Bathsheba. <laughs> David had sinned big time. He had broken three commandments outright. He had coveted Bathsheba. He committed adultery. And he murdered Uriah the Hittite. Uh, and uh, there was nothing in the sacrificial system. There was no forgiveness offered to him. The sacrificial system and having and bringing a lamb and confessing your sins on the head of the lamb and having the lamb slain and his blood poured out that atoned to cover it for your sins were those sins that you were unaware of but you may have committed. They were sins that uh, you didn't mean to but they happened. There was no sacrifice for when you outright just did something and you were rebellious against God. There was no sacrifice for that. And that's why David says in Psalm 51, You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Therefore, David's case is hopeless. So even when he recognizes his own sin, uh, even when uh, Nathan comes to him and tells him the whole story about the man that had the lamb and he took it away from these people and so forth and David's enraged all over it. You know, we should kill that guy. And he says, well, you actually, you're the man. That's exactly what you've done. David at that point realizes his sin and he is hopeless because there is nothing under the law. There is nothing under the sacrificial system. There's no way he can get a relationship back with God. Yet he's able to write this very beautiful psalm. It talks about the fact that your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the summer. He talking about the conviction he was under for a year or so before he ever dealt with this sin and recognized it. And he finally throws himself basically on the mercy of God. F.F. F. Bruce, wonderful Greek scholar, says, If we examine the remainder of the psalm to discover the ground in which he was acquitted, it appears that he simply acknowledged his guilt, cast himself in faith, on the mercy of God. That's what David did. Uh, you know, a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people love to study the life of David. And a lot of people can't stand it because he just blew it so many times with the wives, with the kids, with the family. Terrible father, you know, terrible husband, great, great military leader, great leader of the nation. Personally, he had major issues and difficulty. You read the Psalms and go, man, this guy had major depression going on. Well, I wonder why. Again, the writer of Hebrews is very clear that under the Old Testament, David could throw himself on the mercy of God uh, and, and trust God for the future when the Messiah would come and die for his sins, Jesus Christ. But in the meantime, he had to deal with a very guilty conscience. The contrast under the new covenant because of what Christ has done, because he's declared us to be righteous and we're justified by our faith. You don't have to. You don't have to have a guilty conscience. Uh, all the stuff and all the biggies and the heavy weight and all the things that maybe you've drug around with you for a number of years can all get left at the foot of the cross because God declares you to be righteous. Are you righteous? No, not practically. I still struggle with my flesh and my sin. I'm tempted by the devil and I live in a fallen world. But it's, it's sure comfort to me to know that in God's sight, I've been declared righteous. I've been justified by faith. David makes two amazing statements here. He says that God forgives sins and imputes righteousness. That's his word, our word, and it's apart from works. There, there was nothing he could do other than faith. And God does not impute sins. He doesn't hold the sin against us any longer. God will keep track of our works, according to James, so that one day he'll reward us when we are before Jesus Christ. God will never keep track of our sins any longer. Does he have Alzheimer's? No. He's, uh, it's not like he doesn't remember. He chooses not to remember, not to hold against, to send away, as we uh, said in our explanation of justification. Uh, and, uh, and that should be very, very meaningful to us. Because we've got an enemy that will come around a lot and say, don't you remember when? How could God love you because... And that's why Paul, you know, when he finally gets the end of this section, he's going to say, therefore, because of everything he's just explained, there is now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Satan is referred to as the accuser of the brethren. He accuses us, but he accuses us before God. And when he does, 
God says, I have declared him righteous. And Jesus is standing and saying, I shed my blood for him. And that, that ends all, all the argument. We got a couple of pretty good, uh, uh, we got the best attorney in heaven and the judge too, uh, all rolled into one on our side. Horatio Spafford kind of, uh, kind of wraps this up in uh, verse 2 of a very classic uh, hymn entitled, It Is Well With My Soul. The first verse talks about the incident that actually prompted uh, the writing of the, of the hymn, if you haven't heard the story. Uh, he lives in the, uh, the mid-1800s uh, uh, and uh, at the time of the Chicago fire. He was an attorney in Chicago, a wonderful believer, and uh, he had already uh, suffered the, uh, the tragedy of losing a son. Uh, he had four daughters uh, and his wife. Uh, Chicago fire comes, a lot, you know, his law practice basically literally burns down, plus a lot of investment property that he had. Uh, the uh, Great Depression comes right after that, uh, and they're left uh, almost penniless. Uh, he sends his, uh, his wife and the four daughters on a ship to sail to Europe. Uh, they're just going to try to get away for a little bit. Uh, he's tied up with some, uh, uh, some actually some uh, commercial zoning political issues in Chicago at the time as they're trying to rebuild and reorganize after the fire. Uh, his wife and the four, uh, four little girls sail off. Halfway across the Atlantic, uh, they run into another ship, and the ship goes down, and uh, he gets a telegraph uh, from his wife that says, saved alone, lost all four daughters. Uh, he uh, boards the ship uh, to go after her, uh, and it uh, tells the captain, could you tell me when we come to the place approximately where the ship went down and where, uh, where my daughters are. So the captain did that. He came up aboard uh, the ship and was inspired to write this. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And then the refrain is, it is well. Uh, with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. That, and that's the, the quote we normally get. But listen to verse 2, because it has to do with this issue of being justified by faith and what it should mean to us. He says, though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh, the bless." bliss of this glorious thought my sin not in part but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more praise the Lord praise the Lord oh my soul there's a reason that we should come in here and worship God on Sunday mornings it's because we're justified by faith and because that debt all of us our wickedness we are the ungodly was all paid for by Jesus Christ on his death on the cross. So Abraham is the prime example of justification by faith. And certainly David's confession in the Psalms, and I'd encourage you to make Psalm 32 maybe one of your favorite Psalms and, uh, and read more of that later. Uh, it, it confirms justification by faith. He had a couple other issues to deal with in his uh, listening audience there in Rome in the first century, uh, and certainly one of circumcision. <clears throat> Verse 9. Uh, does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only? If, da if Abraham is the example, if David supports it, is this a Jewish thing? Uh, they would ask, Paul would say, is it upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For what uh, we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe. Though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be, there's our word again, imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith, which our father uh, Abraham had while still uncircumcised. Certainly there's a Jewishness to his uh, arguments here, uh, but he starts out with the typical rhetorical question. Is this blessedness? What's the blessedness? Being justified by faith. Is it for the circumcised Jews or is it also for the Gentiles? That's maybe a, a better uh, translation for us. Now Paul's already made it clear in Romans 2 
uh, that uh, uh, the change, the circumcision that ultimately counts is of the heart, uh, inward, not of the flesh. The law could not give us or make any change into us internally. Again, in chapter uh, 15, uh, verses 4 to 6, records that Abraham would be the heir of the promise. In chapter 16, verse 16, records that he's 86 years old when Hagar bears Ishmael. Remember, he's, he's hanging in there believing for the promised child. Uh, Sarah comes up with the idea, uh, which was accepted culturally, it was a custom. She buys into it rather than holding into trusting God's word. And she gives uh, Abraham her handmaiden, Hagar. Uh, she conceives from Abraham, has a child, has Ishmael. Uh, he's 13. Uh, uh, he is born. And it's uh, 13 years later we get to chapter 17, verse 24, uh, when then the rite of circumcision comes up. That's going to be the sign of the covenant. What's the sign of the covenant? That God will not flood the earth again with water. It's the rainbow. What's the sign of the covenant uh, of our relationship with God under the new covenant? It's the cup and it's the bread. What is the sign of the covenant that Abraham has received these promises? You know, again, a physical descent, the land, the blessing, and so forth. It's circumcision. It does not occur until years uh, after he believes the promise. That's the point. We would say, assuming Hagar gets pregnant right away, it's 14 years later. Uh, Jewish chronology would put it at 29 years later. So he believes the promise while he's uncircumcised. So the promise comes to Abraham while he's still a Gentile. Shocking, shocking statement. He's uncircumcised. He believes God and he is justified by faith in chapter 15 as a Gentile. And then 14 to 29 years later, he follows through with the rite of circumcision and becomes Jewish at that point. So who is it that can be justified by faith? Those that are circumcised or those that are uncircumcised? The Jews only or the Gentiles also. And Paul says it's very clear that Abraham was a Gentile when he was justified by faith. Therefore, he is the father of us all the Jew and the Gentile justified by faith. Does that make sense? You know, it's very interesting as well. You know, the kids sing that song. I don't know if Kathy here, like I did in the first year, help me remember the lyrics, you know, the Father Abraham has many sons. Yeah, so these kids are singing this. Is that because they're all Jewish over there? No, it's because of this passage of scripture right here. Abraham does become the father of us all. Why? Justification by faith. Because for him, it happened before he was ever Jewish. Of course, he, uh, he ends up being the example to, to the Jews as well. It's for both. He is the father of us, of us all. It, it's interesting, just on a side, you know, in, in going to Israel, there's certainly places there that should uh, really impact our lives because Jesus was there. He walked there. He stood there. Uh, you know, he, was, uh, he taught generally in this area. And there's other places. No, he stood right there. You almost feel like he should take your shoes off because he stood right there, uh, and a few people do. Uh, there's also other places you go to, and they're just, they're just there. We're there because Abraham did something, and it's like, I don't know why, but this kind of moves me just as emotionally, and there's some connection there or whatever, and, and it's, it's kind of like I, I can't figure out what's going on between my heart and my mind and my spirit and trying to, why, why do I sense this, feel this? And I think a lot of it has to do with what Paul is saying right here. He really is the father of us all. The principle applies to everyone uh, based on the confession of David in the Psalms. Abraham is our prime example. Well, then he goes back to the idea of the promise. Abraham received the promise by faith, verse 13 to 15. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, Faith is made void and the promise made of no effect because the law brings about wrath for where there was no law, there is no transgression. So Abraham received the promise through faith before the law. Uh, how long before? Well, Paul tells us in Galatians 3.17 uh, that he received the promise and the law came 430 years later. So that's, uh, that's quite, quite, a, quite a bit later. So we'd certainly say the, the promise has nothing to do with the law. 
And therefore, the law cannot invalidate the promise. In fact, these two things are mutually exclusive here. Paul writes his entire uh, letter to the church at Galatia about that, that the law and grace are mutually exclusive. Pe people, again, uh, in, uh, in pews and chairs all around the country today, uh, many of them have been saved by grace and now believe because they've been saved by grace and they have the Holy Spirit, now they can keep the law. All of it, all 633 commands. No, they just want to pick some. They usually pick the ones that kind of work for them, <laughs> that they're pretty good, the ones they're pretty good at, as though that has something to do with their relationship with God, something to do with being made righteous. And Paul says, no, these two things are mutually exclusive uh, from each other. And again, the key word here is promise. Abraham was justified by believing the promise, not obeying the law. The law did not even come around for another 430 years. Secondly, Abraham could not receive the promise by keeping the law. He couldn't like somehow again keep the law and become a good enough person to receive the promise by faith. And that's a misconception as well. In fact, I was uh, uh, just hearing about a young guy uh, recently. And uh, I know it was my understanding growing up in the church that basically uh, you kind of had to get it together in order to become a Christian. You know, I mean, it just doesn't take anybody. And there's not anybody could go there. In fact, the church I went to, not everybody could go there. You, you pretty much had to kind of get it together. I don't think you'd really be accepted by anyone there or on a Sunday morning or, any, or anything else. In fact, at this day, they still wouldn't even take me as a member. I'm just too much of a sinner, literally. Uh, but uh, uh, that's a problem that people have out there in the world. Uh, you know, they're singing the Christmas carols and thinking about Jesus. They kind of get it. He died on their sins. And, you know, maybe, you know, but, you know, you don't know what I'm going through. You know what my struggles are. I, I got to kind of get it together. I got to kind of get it together. I'm kind of struggling with this issue here in my life. If I can get it together, yeah, maybe I'll come to church with you sometime. And our message is to them is you're never getting it together. And that's the whole point. No, you come to Christ and then he'll get it together. You come to him and be justified by faith, have a relationship with him, be able to talk to him, read his word, grow in your relationship. He changes you from the inside out. Here's Paul's summary statement in verse 16 uh, of everything we've covered in those last two sessions. There, here's the therefore. Always important to see what the, the therefore is there for. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, not only to the Jews, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, that's the rest of us, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. So Paul says the promise made to Abraham back in Genesis 17, 5, I've made you a I will make you a father of many nations, is fulfilled in the doctrine of justification by faith. This makes Abraham, again, the spiritual father of all who are believe and who are justified. And it's Jews, that's Gentiles, that's everyone. And I just hope that we can, uh, you know, hear what the hymn writers of old understood, certainly. That's uh, uh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It should be really sweet to our ears if we understand that he saved a wretch like me. That we were like David as well. We may not have committed adultery, murdered somebody, uh, and coveted. But we're, I think we're all covered the, the covet part. That's just wanting something that's not yours and you want to have it so somebody else doesn't. Uh, uh, just watch a few TV commercials and they'll make you covet if you're not sure about that. That's what they're designed to do. I didn't even know I wanted that. I think I ought to have one of those now. You know, uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's amazing. Yeah, that's what they're designed to do. Uh, and we're, in David's case, we are hopeless but you and I could recite and say, uh, blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered, if we've come to faith in Christ. We could, we could write that psalm, and certainly we should read it. We all fall into that same category. I read you one older hymn earlier, just one verse from uh, another one. Uh, uh, Horatius Bonner of 1861 writes, not what these hands have done, can save this guilty soul. Not what this toiling flesh has borne can make my spirit whole. Not what I feel or do 
can give me peace with God. Not all my prayers and sighs and tears can bear my awful load. None of those things. Thy work alone, O Christ, can cease this weight of sin. Thy blood alone, O Lamb of God, can give me peace within. Thy grace alone, O God, to me can pardon speak. Thy power alone, O Son of God, can this sore bondage break. I bless the Christ of God. I rest on love divine. And with unfaltering lip and heart, I call this Savior mine. And it's a wonderful thing to call him his, your Savior. It means all the difference in the world.
never sheltered me from the wild storm. I'm gonna wrap myself in you, Lord. Yeah.